Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Don Brown and Amy Peacock. Good to see you, brother. Thanks for coming. Man. wake you all up. Okay. So every year, about three to four times a year, we poll our museum visitors to ask them what exhibit they might want to come back to see while they're here at the Reagan Library. And without fail, whenever we test the concept of World War II, it tests extremely high, first place if not second. So in July of 2019, our teams here at the Reagan Library and the Reagan Foundation met to brainstorm a World War II exhibition that we could put together on our own to wow our visitors. We even met with folks from the National World War II Museum in late of 2019. And then of course, as we all know, COVID hit, closing our museum and museums and businesses around the world. But we kept meeting over Zoom, of course, with our internal team to brainstorm this World War II exhibition. And in the middle of 2021, we all agreed an exhibition on the secrets and the untold stories of World War II. And on April 2nd of this year, the Secrets of World War II exhibition opened. As part of the exhibition, we thought it would be fun to bring in speakers who covered World War II in the current books. And while researching books, lo and behold, I received an email from a publisher about a book by Don Brown and Amy Peacock, a book about the untold stories of World War II General William Rupertus and how the Marines, under his command and others, brought down the Japanese in the Pacific in 1942. We knew immediately we needed to include them in our programming. In learning his story and reading the book, which you all should do, it seems shocking that his story is mostly untold. A man who at 23 was told due to kidney failure he's going to die by 28. Instead, he went on to serve 32 years in the Marine Corps, ultimately becoming a major general. A man who wrote the Rifleman's Creed, the Creed Marines still to this day memorize and stand by. A man who was so instrumental to the success of the military during World War II that in 1945, the US Navy destroyer USS Rupertus was named in his honor. A man whose heroism, intelligence, and fortitude helped him lead military victory in Tulagi, Guadalcanal, and Peleliu. Yes, it is shocking that this story is mostly untold. So let's tell it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guests tonight, Don Brown and his co-author, who is also the granddaughter of General Rupertus, Amy Rupertus Peacock. Uh, good evening. Yeah, it's good to see you all. Thank you for being here. It is such an honor to be at the Reagan Museum. I'm, we are such fans of Reagan and um, President Reagan. Um, I want to thank my family for being here, uh, and my sister Kimberly, who lives in California. I'm, we're from Charlotte. Kimberly lives um, in Manhattan Beach, and she was hugely helpful to the research on this book, and um, we couldn't have done it without her. Uh, so I want to thank everybody. We have another sister, Heather, who could not be here, but she's probably watching online or will be soon. Um, the story is... Fascinate has always been fascinating to us about General Rupertus, um, our grandfather. Um, like Melissa alluded to, uh, he, it's a secret because his story has not really been told until now. So um, he was born in 1889 in Washington, D.C. He died in 1945 in Washington, D.C. Uh, he wrote My Rifle, The Creed of a United States Marine. In 1942, right after the Japanese had bombed us at Pearl Harbor, um, he did two tour tours in China as a uh, China Marine with the 4th Marine Division, um, once in Peking, where he lost his first family to uh, scarlet fever. His wife was 
38, his son was 14, and his daughter was four, and they all died um, of a scarlet fever epidemic. Uh, then he went back to China in, in, in 1937 under a very dramatic uh, a change in situation um, with his new wife, or she had been, they'd been mar married for uh, five or six years, um, Sleepy, who was our grandmother, and um, uh, they were there protecting the American sector of the international settlement. Um, he was CEO of the 1st Battalion, 4th Marines. Then he uh, went on to command the 1st Marine Division, um, first under General Vandergriff, and then on his own um, as division commander, for the longest divi division commander in the Pacific at the time. Uh, and then, yes, he had a naval destroyer named after him, the USS Rupertus DD-851, um, that served our country from 1945 to 1973, and then went on to serve uh, the Greek Navy. So. Um, we're um, really excited to share this story. Uh, the story. You know, World War II started on December, or at least we got into World War II, uh, America, December 7th, 1941, after the Japanese bombed us at Pearl Harbor. But I want to take you back to August 1937, when our grandfather was stationed in Shanghai with our grandmother as part of the Marines protecting the American sector of the international, the Shanghai International Settlement. On August 13th, they had been there since April 1937. Everything changed on August 13th, 1937. The Japanese had pulled up their, um, they'd been building up their navy since the 20s, and um, they were making their way into China, and on this day, they, uh, their ships uh, pulled up and they attacked Shanghai, bombed Shanghai. Um, the, there was cement flying everywhere, bodies, blood, everywhere. It was total war instantly. Everything had changed. And the uh, refugees flooded into the international settlement. The, um, the, all the nation's guards that were part of this international settlement went on alert. The American sector was um, 3.5 miles perimeter. And the Marines set up uh, 59 checkpoints uh, all around the perimeter with um, barricades, sandbags, um, barbed wire, machine gun nests, and um, they were the first line, the main line of resistance uh, protecting the American sector um, so the uh, Japanese didn't come in if they would have at that time. So it was highly intense and for weeks and weeks they, they standed guard 24 by 7 and they had stray shrap shrapnel, gunfire, cement, whatever, you know, just cutting knives across the, their area around the settlement, their perimeter, um, into their skin, but they were told to hold fire. So the president, President Roosevelt, I'm not President Roosevelt, um, but um, the president, uh, yeah, Roosevelt said that, um, sorry. 37, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> said, hold fire. We, and, and that went, was sent down, hold fire. These Marines were, who were watching all this this violence before them, this war, this, this executions, everything that you could imagine that happened, um, and being taunted by the Japanese, they could not fire, they could not respond, because we did not want to go to war with Japan in 1937. So our grandfather in the Marine Corps history says it is here where he met his future foe. And I thought that's quite an understatement. Because after the, they stayed there till 1938, but after, the, after Shanghai fell, the uh, Chinese military went down to Nanking, and the Japanese followed them to Nanking. And at Nan Nanking, um, in December 1937, the USS Panay and three standard American tankers were trying to evacuate uh, the American citizens because there was so much danger. I mean, there was no place for them to be. They needed to get out of there. And um, they were bombed by the Japanese. So it was a huge international American problem that we had to tamp down because we just didn't, we weren't prepared to go to war, I believe, in 1937. So fast forward to 1938, there, um, Admiral Yarnell, who was a naval officer, commanding officer in that area, and Colonel Price, who was Marine Corps officer, uh, commanding officer in that area, wrote home to headquarters and to friends in the Marine Corps and the Navy that, wow, this is re really intense. And we're, we're seeing stuff we have never seen in war. Um, and if we don't do something now to stop this aggression, 
and this violence and this, this brutality, they will come to our shores. And fast forward, <laughs> December 7, 1941, they did bomb us at Pearl Harbor. They, they bombed our naval, naval fleet at Pearl Harbor, killing over 2,000 people. Um, so at that time, our grandfather was uh, at the Marine Corps Base San Diego, and he got promoted. Everything changed, again, overnight, and um, he became commanding officer of the Marine Corps Base San Diego. Thousands of young men came flooding into the system, wanted to go revenge, get revenge on the Japanese, and um, he, I guess I should start showing some of these, but he, um, it was then when he wrote the Rifleman's Creed because he knew that he was an expert rifleman. He had been on the rifle, Marine, Marine Corps rifle team when he was a young Marine. Um, and uh, he also uh, felt really important, it was really important for the Marines. He knew these Japanese, he knew their capabilities and that they took no prisoner. And he wanted them to be prepared to fight the, the Japanese in the Pacific. So that's when he created this Rifleman's Creed. So I'm not quite sure how to use this here. There we go. So I covered that. So here is a picture of the Marine Corps officers. Uh, he's on the right with his head bowed down. Uh, and um, they're, they're, they're in, within the American sector of the, the international settlement, trying to figure out the next step, I imagine. This is some pictures that we have um, of the bombing of Shanghai and the devastation. And then there's a Marine with his rifle um, ready for action. <laughs> so fast forward, um, uh, he wrote the Rifleman's Creed. Um, he had started the Marine Corps Chevron. He, he wanted to write this not as like a, a sermon. He wanted to uh, write it so um, uh, the Marines would really feel it internally. You know, this is my rifle, this is my gun. Um, so fast forward, um, it's, uh, this is published in March. General Vandergriff wants him to join the 1st Marine Division with the training and the forming of the 1st Marine Division in the Pacific. Um, and this is that in April 1942, so in March 1942, he joins Vandergriff in New River, North Carolina, where they, uh, they were, um, which is, it was called Tent City, it's now called Camp Lejeune. Um, but here's a picture of them. This is in April 1942. They're in the so in Solomon's Island, Maryland, and they're watching the amphibious training going on. Um, and this is Secretary Knox, um, uh, General Holcomb with the pipe, and then Rupertus on the right. I'm pretty sure that's Pete, Colonel, or Pete Taval, Valle. Um, but again, they were training inland because the Germans were prowling on the coast, the east coast, so they can couldn't um, really train on the coast. So, 1942, things were pretty tough uh, for us. We were not on the offense, and the, but the Japanese were. And um, you can see from this, you can see the uh, Japanese limit of advance, or I should say, everything they had taken over, um, that we were gonna have to go um, meet them at. So it's a really fascinating story building up to this. So you think that Japan really, if you, or, uh, if you look back in the history, you can see Japan was building up their navy in their 20s, in the 20s, and then they got into uh, China in 1931. They had an attack um, at Manchuria, then Shanghai, Shepei, 1932, and then in 1937, July, was um, the attack um, in Marco Polo Bridge outside of Peking, and then by 1937, they bombed Shanghai, 1941, Pearl Harbor. So um, with that, I'm going to let Don step up and set the stage for going into the Pacific. Thanks, Amy. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh, where's my tech guy? I knew this thing was going to pop off. <laughs> Just one of many emergencies. We, hey, tech guy, what, what's my friend's name? What's, what's my gentleman's name? Yeah, I know, but is, what's his name? You remember? Hey, all right, I'll, I'll just stick it in my pocket. You, 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 you stand down. We're good. Anyway, who knows what will happen. But uh, I also want to join Amy in thanking Melissa Giller, our director here. This is the second time I've been blessed to speak here at the Reagan Library. And I want you to know that it's almost like 
a fine bottle of Dom Perignon. It gets better over time, and the exhibits and the organizational and everything about what we're seeing today is even better than it was in 2017. The Ronald Reagan Foundation and Presidential Institute and the Reagan Library are treasures to the United States of America. It's the place we come, and please give Melissa a hand, and please give the library staff a hand for hosting us. And uh, I hope to come back again someday. I'm very, very blessed. Well, it is incredible that there has never to this day been a memoir written about one of the great commanders, military commanders, not just in World War II, but in American history. That is Major General William Rupertus. We're going to set the stage 80 years ago, early 1942. Amy can figure out how to work these things. Which one do I hit, Amy? <laughs> the arrow to the right? Yeah, what do you know? You <laughs> 80 years ago, 80 years ago, July, going into August, the United States was in a precarious situation. The Japanese had struck Pearl Harbor. They struck Midway. As you can see, they moved into the Philippines, into Singapore. They took all the British protectorates around the Pacific Rim. They were on a military rampage at the time. And maybe you remember, in April of 1942, General Wainwright had surrendered uh, approximately 75,000 American and Filipino forces in the Philippines. This is, some would say, the largest defeat in the history of the United States military. Some would argue that, you know, in the Civil War we had some rough stuff going on, but we were losing on the ground. Uh, the Navy stepped in in 19, first of all, the Battle of Coral Sea and fought the Japanese basically to a stalemate. The Japanese were trying to move south to increase their influence eventually into Australia. Coral Sea comes along and then June of 42, one of the, the greatest victory in the history of the United States Navy. I'm a naval officer or a former naval officer. This is a, one of the greatest victories in the history of naval warfare at Midway. Went through by the grace of God and the help of some cloud cover and some carriers being in the right place at the right time. We took out four Japanese carriers and took a lot of the power out of their navy. But as will be seen, that still wasn't enough, and we had a long way to go. General William Rupertus commanded four of the great significant battles of World War II. I'll talk about in a moment the Battle of Tulagi. Not only the first ground victory in the Pacific, but from what we can tell, the very first ground victory for the United States in all of World War II. That there has not been anything written about this is beyond incredible. Uh, he also commanded uh, the Battle of Henderson Field, the largest and final battle on Guadalcanal at the end of 1942. And then the Battle of Cape, Cape Gloucester, I'll talk about that in a second. And then his final battle was in Peleliu in the Palu Islands. I want to set the stage here. Melissa said they're so organized, they went back and watched me last time to figure I'd walk all over the place, but it's because I can't half read. This is August of 42. You, you can see where our forces are juxtaposed. The Japanese are controlling everything from the Solomon Islands all the way up, and their target now is Australia. So we've got to hit them there. So a U.S. Naval Task Force of a total of 75 ships, including about 12 transports of United States Marines, is now moving from, they've been in New Zealand, north in toward the Solomon Islands. You can see Guadalcanal right there. Um, they would approach into... Uh, Guadal the Guadalcanal area, and, and let me just back up just a second here, into two targets. Tulagi at the top is going to be hit first by General Rupertus with 3,000 Marines. After that, uh, the, the lower arrow is commanded by General Vandegrift, who is an overall command at the 1st Marine Division at this time with about 11,000 Marines. But Tulagi is significant because Tulagi Island is the head of the British command and control in the Solomon Islands. They have, the Japanese have come and taken Tulagi. They built and seaplane bases at Tulagi and Gavatu, and they pose a very dangerous threat. It has to be taken out before we can come in and take Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal is going to be fought over because of an airstrip that's being built. The Japanese want to control, they want to control this airspace. And why? Because remember, this is August. In June, just two months earlier, the Navy, our Navy, has sunk four Japanese carriers. So now they don't have the forward air project projection they have because their carriers have been sunk. So they want Guadalcanal. Tulagi Island has to be taken first. It's about three and a half miles long in length, half a mile at its widest point. It looks almost like the island of Cuba from the, from the air. One of the things that the general did is he executed a very daring maneuver. 
It hasn't been taught about. If you look at the northwest part of Tulagia, where Oregon would be, against the southwest part down where Florida would be, the entire island was surrounded by a horseshoe of coral all the way around the island except for in the southeastern part, which is where the Japanese had their forces. Now, what Rupertus did, he rolled the dice with a gamble because the Japanese, they knew we were coming, but they were fortified in the southeast. Rupertus pulls a daring maneuver and has his Marines come up as close as they can and stop at the coral. They're over 100 yards away. The Marines were jumping out of their Higgins boats, sometimes up to their necks, sometimes over their heads, and having to walk in so that they could achieve surprise. And they moved down, commanded by Colonel Edson of Edson's Raiders, and attacked the lower part of the island. A picture of the general on board his command ship watching the area. This is an actual photograph of our Marines on D-Day at Beach Blue in Tulagi Island. These are United States Marine Raiders under the command of, general, of, of Colonel Edson. Another overall shot here, I won't belabor, belabor it too much, but there are two objectives here. There's Tulagi Island, as you can see, and a few hundred yards off, there's a smaller combination island, islands of called Tanambogo and Gabutu. The Japanese have built dangerous seaplane bases at all these places. And Tulagi, by the way, is a great deep water port. Later in the war, Tulagi and not Guadalcanal is where we would build a naval base. An aerial photograph of Tulagi burning on D-Day. You can see the fires coming up here. Uh, this is a closer shot of Gavatu and Tanamboga. Remember, they're just off the coast of Tulagi, and there is a land bridge between the two of them, and it's going to take us a couple of more days to route the Marines out. There's a group at this time called the Marine Paratroopers, the first paratrooper uh, unit that hits uh, at, seven, at, at noon. The, the uh, initial attack that morning on the 7th comes at 8 o'clock on Gavatu. Then we hit, Tula we hit um, I'm sorry, Tulagi is at 8 o'clock. Then we hit Gavatu at noon. This is a photograph of Gavatu burning. You can see this land bridge that we talk about. The Japanese are dug in pretty hard. It takes us until really the 9th of, Dece of August. And on the, 9th of, on the 8th of August, Tulagi falls making the first ground victory the next day on the 9th of August, Gavatu and Tanambogo fall. Now, I want you to think about this from a trivial standpoint. This is, this is August the 9th, 1942, three years to the date before the final atomic bomb is dropped on August the 9th, 1945. I don't know if that's fate or if it's coincidence or what, but from the very first victory until the final operation, exactly three years. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a photograph of the general and his staff. This was taken on Tulagi Island. Where's the general, Amy? Where's your grandfather? Oh, I see him. Yeah, in the middle, right there. With the, right, there we got, we've got an era to him after they had taken control of Tulagi. One other thing that happened around this battle is something called the Battle of Savo Island. This also does not get enough attention. The Navy had gone in to provide protection for our Marines. Remember I said there were 75 ships altogether. Those included the ships that the Marines were in, the landing craft, and then our U.S. Naval and Australian uh, uh, destroyers and cruisers are out here to try to, to block the Japanese from coming in. They've lost their carriers, but they are still lethal. They're coming in from a place called Noumea. I'll show you that just in a second on New Britain. But, uh, excuse me, um, Rabul, right? Rabul, they're coming in from Rabul. Now, on the night of August the 8th, the day after D-Day, the Japanese launched a surprise attack. They don't have any carriers, but they launched a surprise attack on our fleet guarding our Marines. How do they do that? They come at night. They've been preparing for night warfare at sea, and we're not prepared. And it turns into a naval disaster. We have over 1,000 sailors dying in one night alone in the Battle of Savo Island. That is the second largest naval disaster after Pearl Harbor. As a result of that, the Navy has to pull out, leaving the Marines largely defenseless. Again, that's by the grace of God that they were able that they're, that these, these are the troop carriers and General Rupertus was on the Neville, as you can see, positioned off of Tulagi Island. Right behind Tulagi is a larger island called Florida. But our transports were temporarily totally vulnerable because we had to pull the Navy out of the of Savo Island. Another photograph there of Guadalcanal, Tulagi, Florida, and Savo Island there. Here's a photograph taken at Guadalcanal. Who's in this picture, Amy? General, General Vandegrift, that had been the original commander of the 1st Marine Division. Uh, after Tulagi was secured, General Vandegrift comes over to Guadalcanal across the way. Tell us about this one, Amy. Uh, 
the, the tape cutters, the red tape cutters? So, um, generals sort of went back and forth between uh, Tulagi and Guadalcanal often. Um, this, I don't know if this is a, sometimes a secret of World War II. Um, uh, Dr. Seuss would create these, uh, these designs for the Society of Red Tape Cutters. The and real so, Dr. Seuss. The real Dr. Seuss. And, um, Vice President Reagan, he was a red tape cutter. <laughs> <laughs> so a uh, number of the officers that were in this first battle um, got these awards um, sent to them over in the Pacific. Admiral Nimitz pinned the Navy Cross in the general for his work at Tulagi. Here's a photograph of that. Nimitz is on the left, of course. This is the slot. I talked a moment ago about Rabul. Remember when the Japanese lost their carriers, they still had a large Navy base at Rabul. And they would send their cruisers and destroyers down this slot in here, and they would hit our guys at Guadalcanal and Tulagi usually at night, and it caused devastating damage. And uh, if you've seen, if any of y'all seen the Pacific, this has shown some of the Pacific when you see bombs going off at night. It's a result of the Japanese attacking uh, at, uh, down the slot. This is just another picture of the General Solomon Islands. Uh, if you'll note here at Rabul, I'm going to come to this in a second, because the Japanese base was here. MacArthur uh, loved General Purtis so much that he eventually wanted control of his division, and I'll get to that in a second, but the Japanese... Navy was causing a lot of damage from Rabul to all of our Marines. Uh, after, I, I didn't hit on one thing because I thought we had a slide on it, but there were three battles on Guadalcanal, three major battles. The first battle was called Alligator Creek, or the Battle of Tenaru. It was fought around September. The second one was called the Battle of Edson's Ridge, and then the final battle was called the Battle for Henderson Field, which occurred October 23rd in 1942. Uh, on the Battle of Henderson Field, General Vandegrift, who at that time still, had, still was in command of the 1st Division, left to go to New Caledonia with the Commandant of the Marine Corps to meet with Admiral Halsey to ask for more support for the Marines. Vandegrift left. As soon as Vandegrift left, the Japanese attacked. General Rupertus was in command of the largest and final battle of, uh, of Guadalcanal at Henderson Field. And that's, that has not gotten out. But we, we have, and I want to commend Amy and her sisters, they have done our, their country a service by assiduously and meticulously keeping records of their grandfather's wartime exploits, including his diaries, including photographs, including letters from Eleanor Roosevelt and Nimitz, and you name it. If you ever visit their home, Edwin's home in Charlotte, it's like having a, a military museum there. So, but we know what happened because there's, there's detailed chronology there, and whose book also corroborated this? You remember the book? Uh, uh, General Twining, no bended knee. Right, who was, who was the uh, chief of staff for Vandegrift, correct? Uh, Jerry Thomas was right, chief, chief of staff. He's, yes, he's... so we know that the general was in command of this, but, but this is the, people don't know this yet. He commanded the final battle in Guadalcanal. Make sure I'm going the right way. After, after Guadalcanal, when we subdued the opponents in Guadalcanal, the Japanese finally capitulated, they sent the 1st Marine Division to Australia to rest and recuperate. Now, one of the biggest problems they had in Australia is that over half the division had malaria. And we talk about COVID, over half of them had malaria. Malaria had, begun, had become as fierce as opponents of Japanese on the ground. So they sent them there to try to recover. And while they were doing this, Eleanor Roosevelt with the Red Cross decided, you know, she wanted to come to Australia. Well, this was driving the American military commanders bananas because you got to get ready for not just the first lady, but a very powerful and influential first lady coming under the auspices of the Red Cross. But the general was selected as one of her escorts, and there are some wonderful pictures there. Uh, I don't know if you have it still in here, but she wrote the general a personal letter. Do we have the letter still yeah, in here? Yeah, it's... Well, we'll get it in a second. She wrote a personal thank you letter. Here are some photographs of the general going back and forth between Guadalcanal and Tulagi. And, uh, and a photograph of him there, was that in Melbourne? Where was that shot, Amy? That was in Melbourne. Oh, right. And he's saluting, they had a parade in Melbourne, right. and right. he's probably saluting the Marine Corps band as they're going by. A lot, a lot of these photographs are in Amy's collection. Some are U.S. Navy and military and other photographs, but a lot of them. Here's the letter I was talking about where General Eleanor Roosevelt's thanking the general on a handwritten note for his escorting her in Melbourne. And... Um, some additional shots here. This is the General and MacArthur. Now, what happened is, who was on the left here, Amy, in that photograph? Do you recall? Chessie Puller. Chessie and Puller? then here, mm -hmm. they're, they're planning right. for Chessie Puller. Right. Uh, Rupertus is uh, pitting an award on Chessie right. Puller. And 
They're, they're planning for the attack on Cape Gloucester. Yeah, Cape Gloucester, New Britain. Let me talk about this for a second. We secured Guadalcanal. We secured the Solomon Islands to help protect given, from giving the, the Japanese a forward operating base against Australia. But remember, Tulagi was also the first victory in the, the famous island hopping campaign that we've heard about. So the idea was to continue to move around in the ocean to begin, and I've got another photo, uh, map here in a moment, to come closer and closer to the Japanese homeland. Remember I said a minute ago, and you saw a picture of MacArthur and Rupertus. MacArthur loved Rupertus so much, he wanted the 1st Marine Division under his command. And so FDR relented one time. Okay, so this is New Britain. Now, the 1st Marine Division was the only division fighting for the United States in 1942. The 2nd Marine Division then came on board, and other Marines are coming here into Bougainville here, and you can't see it here, but Rabul is up to the right of New Britain. MacArthur wants to strangle the Japanese position where the naval base is here. We might have another, there's a, we might have another picture. Here's a better picture. If you can see Rabul right up here near, near uh, New, I New Ireland, you can see Cape Gloucester on the other side. You can see Bougainville where the Marines, other Marines were attacking there. So MacArthur wants to put a noose around that naval base in Rabul. So he persuades Roosevelt to let them take command of the 1st Marines, and they're going to come after Cape Gloucester. And they come after Cape Gloucester Boxing Day, December 26, 1943. It's a, it's a highly efficient expedition. It's a photograph of the general reading a communique from President Roosevelt congratulating on their victory. Some more photographs from uh, Cape Gloucester. Amy, pitch in if you want to. This is That's good. Uh, general MacArthur was so happy with uh, Rupertus's performance that he comes uh, to uh, Cape Gloucester, and you can see them there. Uh, I don't know where his corncob pipe is, but they're walking there together in this, this photograph. Now, I talked a moment ago about the, the sweep across the Pacific. Remember the idea is island hop, island hop, island hop before you get to Japan. So after Cape Gloucester, we look at Peleliu Island. This is in the Pal Palau Islands. Um, well, we're out of order a little bit. This is a general in Bob Hope. After Cape Gloucester, they came and had another holiday at a place called uh, Pavuvu, Pavuvu, and yeah. uh, it really wasn't like Melbourne. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of bad, mosquito infested, so Bob Hope came to cheer the troops. But anyway, let me go back to the Palau Islands here. You can see the Marines are moving now up this way, and the idea will be to move all the way to the Japanese homeland. The Palau Islands are here on the map. Um, they're about 500 miles off the coast of the Philippines. You remember when MacArthur was run out of the Philippines, out of Corregidor, he made the famous statement, I shall return. Well, MacArthur wanted to go back to the Philippines bad. And by this time, there was a debate between the Army and the Navy over what to do. The Navy, under Nimitz, wanted to go straight for the Japanese homeland. Roosevelt wavering back and forth. They did decide, finally, to go to Peleliu because when, when you can see the Philippines here, this is Mindano here, and the little red is where the Palau Islands are located, MacArthur was concerned if he hit the beaches in the Philippines, the Japanese would hit them from their base there at Peleliu. So that's why this all came about. So October 23rd, what day did Peleliu? No, September 15th, 1944, our forces hit Peleliu. It's, the name of the operation was Operation Stalemate, part of the Palau and Mariana Islands campaign. The Army had by this time shifted in to the war. Uh, this is uh, late 44. We had already secured Normandy. We're marching toward Germany. The Third Army was on the march. And uh, Peleliu itself is this little red place in the southwest quadrant of the Palau Islands. Several points about this battle. Um, it was, first of all, it was the first battle uh, between the Army and there was a battle, as I mentioned, between the Army and the Navy and where to execute this at all. The Navy advocated against it. By this time, MacArthur, but Rupertus had been moved back under the command of the Navy. MacArthur got him for one battle. Um, MacArthur initially advocated against for it. The Navy was against it. Also, it was a huge shift in the Japanese battle tactics. If you've anybody seen anybody seen that movie, I mean, that series, The Pacific. Anybody seen that? Tom Hanks. Well, if you've seen it, you'll, what you'll see, a part of it's accurate. When the Marines come onto Guadalcanal, they come on unopposed. That was not true at Peleliu. There was a big battle there, but on Guadalcanal, coming in a post, why the Japanese had gone into the, into the woods. 
And so the strategy was to withdraw, let the Marines come in, and then surround and attack. That happened all the way up until this battle, where they changed their battle attacks. They went under the ground, and they, hit the, they would hit the Americans right on. So the Marines were hitting the first wave in the southwest, right down here, which is where the airfield was, which is the principal Japanese military threat in the region. This is, uh, sort of shows the overall, uh, the overall Japanese influence of the height of the expansion of the war, which, of course, was eventually pushed back. You can see here uh, the Palau Islands and Peleliu and how close it is to the Philippines. That's why MacArthur wanted it, because when he came back and said, I shall return, he didn't want the Japanese launching airplanes from there. But it turned out to be the bloodiest battle of the war at the time. Um, here's some photographs. Amy, feel free to chime in on any of these if you like. These are all Peleliu, correct? Yeah, you just keep going. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, this is a, a Grayside service. The Chesty Puller is there. The general is here, right? Mm -hmm. And Chesty Puller is right there. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was something that we had not expected in large part because naval intelligence was not c capable of giving us the information that we needed at the time. It had to do with a product of where our intelligence capabilities were at the time. The Japanese had gone inside the island, much like they did at later at Iwo Jima in, the, in February of 45. What's this picture, Amy? So this is a, Rupertus, or a picture of Rupertus and uh, his staff. Uh, he's there with a the cane. Colonel Selden is next to him on the right. And you can see he just looks like... Peleliu, right? Yeah. These are Peleliu mm -hmm. photographs. Yeah. Here are some fabulous photographs. Amy, why don't you comment on these if you would? So this is uh, our grandfather with our father, Pat, who also went on to be a Marine. Marine aviator. Marine aviator. Vietnam. Great from the, graduated from the Naval Academy in 1962. And here, um, Rupertus is getting the, at Quantico on the left, getting the Distinguished Service Medal. Um, and I believe that's General Tory putting yeah. it on him. This is when he, uh, they brought the general back home in November of 44, put him in charge of the Marine schools at Quantico. This mm -hmm. is where that was taken, correct? Yes. Yeah, uh, so big Marine ceremony. schools at Quantico were teaching battle, they would teach battle tactics on how to finish the war in the Pacific. I believe that the general would have been promoted to Commandant of Marine Corps. Yeah. And of course, he passed away suddenly in 1945 of a heart attack. Why don't you share that a little bit? How'd right, you he, um, he came back from the war, war in uh, November 1945, or 44. Um, he went to uh, the Quantico to be at the Marine Corps schools, head of the Marine Corps schools. Um, uh, he basically went up, he, he and our dad and Sleepy, our grandmother, her name was Sleepy, um, went up to to a party at the Marine Corps Barracks, the old Marine Corps Barracks in Washington, a party of old 1st Marine Division veterans. Um, he said he didn't feel well. He walked out on the steps and had a heart attack. Um, so um, he had been home four or five months, and um, his life was taken so soon. Um, but by summer that year, um, well, here they're... Um, this is in Okinawa, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're um, putting a, first, a flag that had been on the 1st Marine Division. It was a promise. Um, to report us that they'd put the same flag that was on Cape Gloucester and Peleliu on this island. And um, here you have, uh, I believe it's right. Colonel Ross putting that up there. Um, and then in 1945, Sleepy was told that there would be a destroyer named after her husband, General Rupertus. And um, here she is uh, at the launching and christening of the USS Rupertus um, in 1945. And on Okinawa was the last major land battle the Army was fully engaged with the Marines at this time, but Peleliu is where the battle tactics change, where they, they're coming out of the caves, you don't know they're there. We saw it very much uh, at Iwo Jima. Uh, Jerry Yellen was at Iwo Jima, we talked about that, and, and we uh, were facing more vicious battle tactics through the remainder of the war. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what else we have, we're getting close. Yeah. 80 years later, we're back in the Pacific. We have Marines on the Palau Islands again, and uh, it's a pretty interesting way that works. And uh, we also have, if I can find it, a very short interview done by the general. Was this? Yeah, we actually, Kimberly found this, I believe, through the Paley Center in um, Los Angeles. Um, but it's a recording that Rupertus did, General Rupertus did, and um, when he came back um, from war, uh, CBS radio interview. Uh, so this is the first time we had ever heard his voice. A couple of minutes. I don't believe there's any measure of comparison. Each campaign was against the same fanatically determined enemy, and each had its own problems of weather, terrain, and distribution of enemy strength. All the campaigns against the Japanese have been hard,
bitterly contested operations that have demanded the utmost of every man engaged in them. I know that every man in every branch of the military service fighting in the Pacific is willing to give, is willingly giving everything he has to achieve a common goal, the complete defeat of the Japanese enemy. If that aim is to be reached, the people back home, each related in blood to a fighting man, must contribute in the same measure. The war against the Japanese is a very personal war. Every bomb and every bullet sounds as though it is meant for you in person. Much of the fighting is at the closest quarters. You are the man that psyche crazed warrior is charging at as he runs screaming toward your lines. You are the man that gleaming samurai sword is going to cut through if you don't strike first. That's just what we've been doing out there, striking first and striking hard. Well, it seems to have been working pretty well, General. We've gone a long way in the Pacific in the last two years. You think we're close to our goal of complete defeat of the Japanese? The hardest part of the war lies ahead of us. As we get close to the Japanese homeland, the Japanese determination and fanaticism becomes even greater. Their military strength also increases as we get closer to its source. This is certainly no time to sit back and contemplate our past successes. Consider the tremendous task that lies ahead and mentally resolve to match in willing personal contribution inspired by the love of country, the fanatic devotion to the emperor that spurs the Japanese. Well, Friday was the 169th anniversary of the founding of the United States Marine Corps, General. What do you think the 170th year holds for the Corps? I think it will probably be one of the fightingest years in our fighting history. We Marines are naturally proud of our past achievements, and as a Marine, I can assure the people of the United States sure that every Marine will. And I'm going to turn this over to Melissa. November 10th is the birthday of Marine Corps, as you Marines know, so this was taken, this was interviewed just after that. Melissa? All right. Well, thank you um, both so much. The screen. For, um, Tricia, we put it back on the PowerPoint so they can just have a better visual behind us? Um, so, I have a bunch of questions. We have a few minutes. I'll just ask a couple of them. But um, first, thank you for that presentation. So you talked about how you both wrote the book, but how did you meet? How did the writing of this book come about? Well, uh, Don had been you, Don had been working on a book about uh, Jerry Yellen uh, that he called The Last Fighter Pilot. You all may have seen him speak here about that. It's a great story about a World War II veteran. Um, and in his research, he had researched, he had been looking into the China uh, period where the Marines were in China. And uh, he came across a picture of our grandfather and his wife Sleepy, our grandmother, and a bunch of Marine officers and uh, naval officers on the steps of the uh, French Club in Shanghai. And he reached out to me on Facebook because we knew each other from Charlotte. And um, he said, Hey, is this your grandfather? And he said, this is, you need so to tell a, a story dis, about him. Very distinguished name, Rupertus. Yeah. And I knew her maiden name was Rupertus, and I just thought, well, I, I wonder. I just wonder. And she had already done tons and tons of research, Kimberly and, and Amy and Heather, and they had done so much research, and one thing sort of led to another. Yeah. Yeah. So it had to do with That's the way things started, tie together right? from Last yeah. Fighter Pod, yeah, researching that book. That's great. So um, we talked about it in the green room downstairs, and and you said perhaps it's because he passed away so soon after he returned. But, you know, he was instrumental in the war. And I think it was Don who said it. He wasn't just a hero of his time. He's a hero of the military in the military's history. Why do you think people don't know his story? Why do you think there's falsehoods about him? Well, I think, uh, I think that as silence creates a problem. And um, when he, he died in 1945 and then our grandmother sleepy died in 1955 and um, I think you know I think silence creates a problem and um, other people try to fill that silence and um, when when someone's not around to say something different you know it's that 
you know, uh, I believe it was President Obama who was at um, the um, Veterans Day, he was the um, Nas National Cemetery in Washington, and he said something that really made me think, you know, if our veteran veterans are not able to tell their stories or won't, it's up to us as civilians to tell it for them. So and that's what we've tried to do. And not only yeah. him, him passing away early, so there was never a memoir and other books were being written, but I think also because his records um, did not surface until his granddaughters uh, got a hold of them years later. And those, again, that, that I give them a Medal of Honor if I was mm -hmm. president because they, they'd done a service, of con a, con a service of the country by keeping these records that they have. So we haven't really had the first-hand information. It's like finding a piece of gold under your house or something. So, I, but I still can't fully under explain why this story hasn't been told earlier, especially the victory at Tulagi is so historically mm -hmm. significant. It's a mystery, but we're happy to be here and grateful to be here telling it now. Okay. So the book itself is fabulous and obviously all of, all the stories it tells um, is riveting but I think one of my favorite parts about the book was how you wrote it in that every two or three pages it's a different not chapter but a section mm -hmm. um, in a different battle from a different general's standpoint from a, you know from the United States side from the Japanese side whose mm -hmm. idea was it to write the book that way no we <laughs> it, was a, it was actually a it was actually a collaborative effort it and, was and yeah. it was a collaborative effort. and the uh, the book is written in what we call a literary nonfiction style, uh, moving quickly, and we really felt it was important to try to, to research and get the Japanese perspective, especially in Tulagi. When we had we had a lot of records from Commander Suzuki, who was the commanding Japanese officer at Tulagi, we knew a lot about what was going on with the Jap with the Japanese from research, and so I, I think it's a good thing to try to as best we can to get into the minds and the viewpoints of all sides. So it was a collaborative effort on that. It was fantastic. Now, I know, um, I believe it was Amy, um, talked about it a little bit in the presentation, but I want to go back to it. I want to go back to the Rifleman's Creed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to this day, Marines memorize it, live by it. Um, they have to recite it by heart to graduate. Um, can you talk about exactly why he wrote it a little bit more in depth than you did earlier? And what does it mean to you and your family to know that this creed that the Marines live by was written by your <laughs> grandfather? Well, I think I, well, I know for a fact that he was, he was when he was recruited to the, the Marine Corps, they immediately, right out of officer candidate school, picked um, him up and a couple of the officers to be on the rifle, rifle team. So they competed all around um, uh, the East Coast. And so he was an expert rifleman. He'd worked in the Naval Gunnery in Washington, D.C. He was very knowledgeable of that. And he was knowledgeable of the Japanese and the enemy, the Japanese, because of his time in China. So by the, by the time these Marines flooded the system at the Marine Corps Depot uh, down in San Diego, he, he seemed to, he must have sensed that they, they were not prepared to meet this enemy. And he knew that they would have their rifle and uh, a canteen, a grenade, and a, a few other things with them in the islands of the Pacific, so they really needed to understand their rifle. And I think he felt that in his heart, and he needed to communicate that to them. And I don't think he ever probably expected that they'd recite it for years and years <laughs> later. Um, so it's, it, it's, I think it would make him very happy. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he really wrote it because um, he felt it so strongly. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just going to ask one last question, and we'll turn it over to the audience. But um, so obviously, reading this book, you get to understand the general as um, uh, in the military and his role of commanding the troops. What was he like as, you know, Rupert is the man? William really, Rupert is the man. Well, we've saved our, our grandmother, and then our father, and then we have saved all of his letters. So we've got letters um, that he was able to write after after Guadalcanal and Tulagi, he started writing a lot of letters. And he was um, very much a uh, 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 kind person, very caring about our grandmother, um, our, our, our father, um, the in-laws. He always would write to them. And um, he wrote to Sleepy, our grandmother, uh, right before uh, the Battle of Peleliu, the day before, um, the night before, um, saying he could sh see the ships out there. Um, you know, in the night, uh, and then under the stars, and uh, that he had prayed for the troops, and he thought this would be fast, but he wasn't sure, and he had just prayed for them, and um, uh, you know, and he didn't know if he'd see her again. But he was very, very emotional in his letters, and very kind, and obviously uh, they felt good enough for him to 
take care of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt when she was in Melbourne. So, yeah, he also seemed to be very much a family man. Mm -hmm. Loved his family very much. Yeah. Um, so, if you have a question, um, just raise your hand. Trisha here with the microphone will bring you the microphone. We do ask that you wait for the microphone to come to you so that anyone watching from home can hear the question. Um, yes, I was just hoping that you could have someone recite or read the creed, the rifle creed. <laughs> okay, um, I'll, I'll do my best. So I've been trying to practice this, and now I'm under pressure, but we'll see. Um, uh, so anybody can help me if there's a Marine in here. But um, um, this, is my, this is my rifle. There are many like it, but this one is mine. My rifle is my life. My rifle is my best friend. It is my, my life. So I must master it as I must master my life. <laughs> Without me, my rifle is useless. Without my rifle, I am useless. I must fire my rifle true. I must shoot straighter than my enemy is trying to kill me. I will shoot him before he shoots me. I will. My rifle and myself know what counts in not this war is not the rounds we fire, the noise of our burst, or the smoke we make. We know it's the hits that count. We will hit. My rifle is human even as I, thus I will learn it as a brother. I will learn its weaknesses, its strengths, its sights, its parts, its accessories, its barrel. I will ever guard it against the ravages of weather and damage as I will ever guard my legs, my arms, my heart, and my eyes against damage. I will fi fire my rifle true. I will keep it clean and ready. I will. <laughs> um, my rifle, no. My rifle and I are the defenders of my, our country. We are the masters of our enemy. We are the saviors of my life. So be it until victory is America and there is no enemy but peace. Talk about pressure. You can now graduate the Marine Corps. <laughs> yeah, I chopped it up a little bit. But. Get her an M4. She's ready to go. Yeah. Anyone else out there have questions? If not, I have a lot more. But anyone else out there? Uh, Trisha right here. It's not a question, it's just a statement. When I was in the basic training in the Army, I had to learn that damn thing too. Mm. Really? <laughs> Cross the services, right. Yeah. The Army picked up it's on it. It's fun to know. Yeah. What would you say your grandfather's main thing was uh, in terms of his military successes? <clears throat> was it tactical? Was it inspirational? How would you uh, characterize how he was so successful in battle? I think um, persistence and tenacity at the, uh, the mission. I mean, persistence down to the beginning when he was told he would die in five years of Bright's disease, to um, losing his family in Peking, getting through all that, going on to face the Japanese in China, and then in, in, um, in uh, the Pacific. He just never stopped. He was, he was, I think persistence um, was what I saw the most. I don't know, my sister may have something else to add, but um, he was definitely was focused on achieving the mission at hand and getting through whatever um, battles that um, he faced. I think he was uniquely qualified for the command that he had. Uh, Amy hit on it, but his time in China was incredible. You look at Shanghai alone, in four months from October. Uh, until January from, um, from 1937, those four months, about 200,000 Chinese were killed. That's half the number of people that America lost in four years. We lost about 400,000. There were 200,000 Chinese, Chinese that died in that period of time. So he, he understood the enemy unique, uniquely because of his two stints in China, probably more than, than as much as many officers, more than most officers. There were some others who were there also, but he was uniquely qualified to lead that division against this enemy. And I think that you can't under, under, underestimate or undersell, under, under, underestimate that, that factor. Um, so we have to wrap up, but oh, there's one more question before we go over there. Uh, while Trish is walking over there, my, my last question was, um, you showed a lot of pictures in this presentation, but there are so many more in this book and there. Fabulous. How many of them were yours? How many were from the military? How many had you never seen before, before going through this in preparation for the book? How did you select the pictures? Well, that was tough. I mean, Kimberly definitely helped with, you know, what should we, what were, what were the most important? Because we do have so many pictures that we've saved from his days in uh, 
he came to Haiti. He was in Haiti. He was with the 1st Brigade in Haiti. So we've got pictures from when the Marines were in Haiti in the 20s and then in the Peking, Cutters. the Revenue Cutter Service. He was part of, he graduated from Re Revenue Cutter, Cutter Service Academy, which is the predecessor to the U.S. Coast Guard mm -hmm. Academy. So we had so many pictures, personal pictures, and then pictures from the Marine Corps that he would get sent. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And that we, makes the book unique. The publisher has worked to put a lot of historical pictures in there as well. Like me, I can't have reads, so I've got to have pictures, you know, paint by number and everything. <laughs> so that's why I like the book, because there are pictures in it. Well, it really helped, uh, tell, the, it really helped tell the story, though, you know, yeah. seeing yeah. him with the different um, people in, in, in the Corps and the yeah. different um, war efforts. That We can go back here. Uh, I'm just curious about how many divisions the Marine has today. That is a good question. I we, got, we got an answer right back here. Go ahead, four, three? three? Three now. <laughs> I think we were at seven. Was it seven? We started the seventh before the end. We're six, and I think we started the seventh at World War II, I believe. Yeah. Um, but that gives you an, And by the way, at the beginning of the Korean War, the history repeats itself because everything mm -hmm. was gutted then. So anyway, it's a study in cyclical history sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to say, if you haven't purchased the book yet, we are selling them over to my right, I guess probably your left. Um, they did a great job kind of giving broad strokes of the book and what um, uh, Amy's grandfather did, but in no way did they talk about, I mean, the book is just drama. Um, every battle, um, what people were going through, the death, the sorrow, the struggle, that's a page turner. So go buy yourself a book and then join us out here, these doors here. They'll be signing um, books to all of you so you can get your personalized copy. And we'll see you over there. And thanks to both of you for joining us Thank today. You. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this evening. If I could please have everyone remain seated as our special guest goes to the